This show is dedicated to helping you strengthen your family tree and live financially free. Welcome to the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, everybody. This is Andy Hill, and today we're talking about developing a deeper connection with your family. As career-driven individuals and busy entrepreneurs, we can get often caught up in the time-consuming race of constantly growing our income and expanding our businesses. While our motivations may be pure, there can be long-term consequences to focusing more on your work than on your family. Well, today I've invited someone on the show who specializes in helping entrepreneurs become more connected with their kids and leaving a lasting legacy. Jim Shields is my guest today. Jim is the founder of 18 Summers, which specializes in live events, workshops, and private consulting for organizations looking to strengthen their family lives while still succeeding in business. He's an in-demand public speaker and owns a private real estate company that has done more than 200 million in transactions. He's also an avid surfer and enjoys traveling with his family and friends, especially his beautiful wife, Jamie, and their four children. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thanks for having me, Andy. Good to be here. Absolutely. So, Jim, how did you become interested in supporting entrepreneurs with their family lives? It all started about 10 years ago because I was going through my own situations. And I read a very interesting article about Steve Jobs having his final days with an interviewer to try to explain to his family why he wasn't there for them. And it showed me that there's an important balance between success in business and success at home. And at that time of reading that article, I had some big things going on in my life. I was running my real estate investment company that I had literally brought back from near bankruptcy from the 08 meltdown. I uh, was in the middle of growing our family from two to four children and suffering the, the pain of miscarriages. And at that time as well, I had just been uh, approved to be able to donate a kidney to my father. And that was a big deal for our family, went through as a a very profound experience. My wife had to step down from her long-term career of running Montessori schools to help me with the recovery and things went great. But I think when you get hit with all those things of critical all at once, I just took on a new curiosity and commitment towards family. And in my own search, I started to share some of the rhythms and strategies that I was doing. And it started to be asked to be shared more and more. A book came out of it, retreats came out of it. And here I am today. Yeah. And you've become not only probably closer to your family in the process, but you've helped a lot of other families as well. Yeah, I am my own test subject. And I always say, I don't know, I wouldn't be able to fake perfection. I have no idea what that even looks like for a family because family life's not about perfection. It's about bridging imperfections. And I think with taking that in the trenches approach where I'm running businesses and doing my best at home, but sharing my experiences and what's working and not, it's really brought together a really nice community of entrepreneur families. That's great. So what do you think happens for you know busy employees or people trying to climb the ladder or people trying to grow their company? Where does that major disconnection start to happen for, for families? I think a lot of it is the pride of providing for your family, which is a big, important role for sure. It's so honorable, but sometimes besides providing, you got to love them as well. And for busy executives and entrepreneurs, we feel like our only needs are within the business. That's our role, that they really need you at home as well. And a lot of people, I don't think it's ever, I think people go after their business goals so hard, so fast, so frantic with the best intentions that the thing we see happen is they stop and finally consciously look around and their family's either gone, but what we see happen way more often is the family's still there, but they view you as a stranger. So we were just going so hard, so fast, almost you know, with blinders on, We've delegated ourselves out of family life. And that's when, you, when that happens, three dominating, dominating emotions take over. And I've done this with thousands of interviews, including my own. And that's guilt, depression, and bitterness. And if you're feeling guilty, depressed, and bitter, you cannot do your best personally or professionally. So it's kind of a vicious circle where we feel like we're being cheated out of family life, but we've delegated ourselves out of it. So there has to become some grounding mechanisms where we can enjoy them along the way. I think that's such a great insight. So 18 Summers, why is it called 18 Summers? Yeah, a mentor of mine taught that to me years ago. Incredible. Uh, his name's Joel. He was an incredible speaking coach when I first started doing family things. And he loved my talks and was coaching me. And he literally stopped one day and just said, Jim, I, if you listen to nothing else I say today, just remember you got 18 Summers because he was 70 years old fit as a fiddle, but his daughters are grown. He said, my daughters are grown. They're still my daughters, but I'm telling you, Jim, it's different. Those first 18 years is when you can make most of the memories, 
really solidify the relationship. So just remember, you got 18 summers. Now for me, I have four children, but two of them I adopted at seven and five. So when I did that simple math, Andy, I go, oh my gosh, wait a minute, a seven-year-old, I'm only 11 summers left before they leave the house. And that just always stuck with me. And the more I started to share it, that simple math equation gave people a positive wake-up call, that the years are not all created equal. That's a saying of my friend David Bach, who's actually a supporter of our 18 Summers movement. And he, um, he and a lot of others, we, we've determined that it is so important to make the most of that time. And even studies have come out since I've heard this from, from my original mentor, that over, it's almost 85% of all the quality time you'll ever have with your children occurs within those first 18 summers, and it dwindles from there. So when you look at that, it, it really puts you on the alert to make the most of the time you have. Absolutely. Absolutely. We get busy and the time goes away. And as your, your friend said, who's in the 70s, it's just different when, when they're older. So let's talk about some of the family rhythms that you've incorporated into your lives and that you also teach to other parents as well. Yeah, I'll talk about a couple principles quickly today. One of them is the principle of one-on-one. -on -one. If you do not listen to anything else on this podcast and you just walk away with this one thing, this is the big aha. And it's so simple and profound and effective, but it's overlooked. And that is one-on-one -on -one time. You have to separate the parts to strengthen the whole. So if you are spending one-on-one -on -one time with your family, it will strengthen the family as a whole and the individual relationships. None of us want to have the next Jan Brady, right? Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. And that seems to happen, but one-on-one one -on -one time takes away distractions, it takes away sibling rivalry, and puts the magnifying glass on a relationship in a positive way. So one, I'm one-on-one -on -one with my wife every Thursday night. If you had tried to do this interview last night, Andy, I know we, we were setting up the schedule from 5.30 to 8.30. I couldn't have done it because that's date night, every Thursday night, and I have that one-on-one -on -one time. Every quarter, I have a day, which is what really my book is about. I have a day with each of my children, one-on-one. -on -one. They're my most important investors, clients, key team members, as far as I see. So I schedule a day one-on-one -on -one with them every quarter. And that is that is just a pillar in our relationship. And then uh, we do different one-on-one different -on -one times. But those are the two that really solidify my family life. And on top of that, I encourage intermittent tech fasting. Now, this is something very important, something we're very proud we coined. If you've heard of intermittent fasting, it's got a lot of study behind it. There is some controversy, but you only eat between certain hours. Let's say you eat between 12 and 7. And the rest of the time, the body is not eating. It's for organ revitalization, weight maintenance, weight loss. Uh, and I think the same thing with technology. I'm not saying to move to a survival ranch and give it all up. But you need periods of complete and total unavailability. You have to disconnect to reconnect. And the phone, that little, you know, if you get something like that and you're there with someone you love and you get that, and let's say it's a text of someone that really messed up something in business you're messing on, well, you're not there anymore. You're working on it. You're out here now, you know, and it really is debilitating to your children's confidence and their closeness to you. I've seen that. So when I'm on that date with my wife, Andy, my phone's not invited. I'm doing a tech fast. When I'm on that half day or full day with my child every quarter, my phone is not invited. When we do, uh, you know, what we do at our house actually is every day now, we do about a two hour period. And I encourage people to start with one hour of intermittent tech fasting for the whole family. Everybody's phones off, everyone's laptops off. And it almost feels freaky at first because you don't realize how much you're getting interrupted until you actually stop getting interrupted. But man, if people will do an intermittent tech fast one hour a day as a family, so no one's distracted, your kids aren't getting wrapped into an Instagram thread that make them angry and take it out on their little brother, or you're not checking an email that you shouldn't be checking right then, there, there starts to become more of a face-to-face -face awareness of each other, deeper conversation, more jokes, more planning of adventures. So I encourage people to do the intermittent tech fasting. Um, the third thing that we really try to use in our family is um, I, I believe in saying the words. Most people, most children and most spouses need two things, and that's a sincere apology or a genuine compliment. And those are so rare. So I really practice, and I won't have time to go through it today, but we go through a whole thing where I give sincere apologies. Even when it makes me feel like you know, wanting to put my dukes up, I've learned that just because I provide Andy and I work, gosh, I'm working hard, I'm running two businesses, doesn't mean I don't mess up and doesn't give me immunity from a sincere apology. And I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs and especially business leaders bully or roll over their children saying, well, I don't have to apologize. Yeah, I messed up, but that, that's a big mistake. Uh, and then with sharing words of genuine compliments, the work I've done in the last 10 years, it's really shocking to see how many people 
go back and say, you know what, you're right. I haven't given a sincere compliment to my wife or my son or my daughter because I never received those. That wasn't how my father was or daughter was. We kind of take this forward. So if we consciously just wake up a little bit and drop those in, not for ulterior motives, not contrived or fake, when you really do them, gosh, do they blend the family together so much better. Absolutely. It gives you an opportunity to strengthen your family tree, take it where it was and create the create the family that you exactly. want. So let's talk a little bit about the one-on-one time because I'm very interested in that. I started that at the beginning of the year this year where I said, hey, I'm going to set aside some one-on-one time for each of my kids you know, every other month. So Zoe gets one month, Calvin gets the next month. Talk about how you structure it with your kids and then how somebody can do this. Yeah. Uh, what I do is big companies out there and, and a lot more entrepreneurials, they have a board meeting, right? A board meeting every quarter. And what's a board meeting? It's to reunite the team and look ahead to the next 90 days. That's what I do with each of my children. They plan the day, we schedule it. That which we schedule gets done. So it's on my calendar and they design the day. So I'm not designing it. We always try to pick like we know what our kids want. You want to learn about their interests and passion, let them plan the day. And it's usually not anything too expensive either. People go, oh, they're going to pick something. They usually don't. Um, so I let them pick the day. And then it's only three principles. It's one-on-one. It's tech fasting, no electronics. And we, we spend time for the, a fun activity of their choice and time at the end of the day to talk. That's it. Uh, that simple strategy now is spread to thousands of families. That was my initial strategy that really coined 18 summers, uh, probably because my oldest son, when I adopted him, he was seven years old. And when I came into his life, he was a terrible student, close to failing. He had just been put on the uh, spectrum at school for autism, and he suffered every night from what's called night terrors. And if you don't know what that, those are, it's, it's a really bad situation. Your kid wakes up crying and screaming. They, it can take hours to get him back to sleep. And it was from things in his past that, you know, were out of his control and my control. But I knew that those things can change from some of the principles we're talking about here today. And I'm proud to say one year later, one year after starting these things, you know, these these every quarter days, my wife and I watched the breakthroughs that occurred that first year. And within one year, Andy, he went from failing to getting this award of the most improved student of the third grade. He they they retracted the diagnosis of autism and admitted it to be a mistake. And because it was stress related, it wasn't autism. And probably best of all, he, uh, within a year, the night terrors were completely gone. That's incredible. Now we got those, yeah, we got those results and there's a time and a place for these things, but we got those results without medication, without therapy. I don't think that's what he needed. He needed a positive role, role model, a dad, which so many kids are looking for, even for successful entrepreneurs who aren't showing up at home. He needed a dad where he felt safe, loved, and appreciated. And that's what that simple rhythm does for our children, Andy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the presence of a father or a father figure even in people's lives can have such an impact for mental growth and physical growth to help you to have a a successful life. So can you talk a little bit about examples of one-on-one activities, some things that you've done with your kids or some fun things you've heard from other families that uh, that have worked well? And I know sometimes when we talk about it, and you mentioned this already, it doesn't have to be a you know, $100, $500 activity. It could be something simple. So do you have any uh, examples that you could share? Yeah, like my oldest son, his, his passion now is fishing. He loves fishing. He wants to be a professional fisherman. He's already trained up, getting his captain's license, all these things. He usually wants to go fishing or surfing, which I love surfing, but I never suggest that because it's about him. Fishing, I like it, but it's not my favorite, but he loves it. So I want to be there for them. So a lot of the times he has to go fishing. We might go to the end of the pier. We might go to the end of our road. Uh, we, might, we might go out on a small boat. You know, So that's one of the examples. My other son is more into electronics. So we've done Segway tours. We've done uh, different things like that. We've done football games. We've done... Uh, pirate museums. We've done climbing the lighthouse. We've done uh, beach adventures, hikes. We've done ATV tours. We've done uh, princess parties. That's with my daughter. Uh, we've done, you know, arts and crafts at, at library day. We've done uh, take your uh, take your dad to uh, another arts and crafts thing, a painting thing. Mm-hmm. So it's there's all sorts of things that you can that you can do. I feel like we've gone ice skating. Uh, we've, we've gone to, um, we've gone to live shows before. There's, there's so many things you can do to, and again, they pick the activity because Andy, one of the things, the worst thing you can do is say, Hey, uh, I love football. So you drag them to a football game for the day 
And at the end of the day, you give yourself a punch to the arm and, and you're like, oh, isn't it great? We bonded. It's like, no, that's not what they wanted to do. That's what you it's, wanted. You went to go see a game by yourself pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, that's very important. It's, it's, never about what I want to do. It's what do they want to do? Yeah. So I let them pick the day, but that's just a few examples to get people, people started. That's great. Well, I, I feel like there's a parent maybe listening right now that's saying, this sounds great. I know I should be doing this and I know it would be good, but I just don't have the time right now. What would you say to that parent? I tell them that which we schedule, it's done. And if you start to put things on your schedule and schedule it and people go, Oh, that sounds so insensitive and, and, and impersonal to schedule time with your child. I disagree. That which we schedule gets done. So I tell people to start to schedule it. When you actually start to look at a 90 day span and you know, you pick one night and again, the best way to get into rhythm is beat the drum the same way all the time. So with a date night, I say to people, I'm ADD. So I forget things. But if I know that, Date night is every Thursday, 5.30 to 8.30. Every Thursday, 5.30 to 8.30. Andy, it's really hard for me to mess that up. Now, if we were picking a different night every week and a different time, a different day of the week, I'm going to mess it up. So make it easy. I try to do something like that, the same thing with my wife. And then with my kid days, I try to schedule them. And I say if quality time is the best defense against lack of connection, addiction, kids going down the wrong paths, it, it 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 will cost you a lot more down the road if you don't make time now. I completely agree. That's that's awesome. I, I appreciate that. So you've mentioned that a major concern that parents have is hoping their kids just appreciate what they have. You know, this show is about building your wealth and giving your kids a great life and everything like that, but that can be a concern too. So how can we help our kids have this type of gratitude and appreciation? Yeah, that's a great question, Andy. And I, it was actually freaky. It was like 99. 8% of the people, and I interviewed a lot of people, all said that, said, well, I want my kids to appreciate what they have. And it's a great thing. I feel it with my four children. So a, a couple of things that I think you have to do is we all walk that fine line of, of handing too much to them. You don't want to do that. That is not, it, it is not a gift. It's a curse. Um, and one of the best ways I found for kids to really appreciate what they have is I get them involved in active service. Now, if I write a check to a charity for $1,000, that's a good thing, but they don't see that. They don't feel that. My kids, my parents used to say, to me, hey, eat up. There are starving kids in China and nothing against that. But I'm sitting in a middle class home in New Jersey as a kid. I, didn't, that, I couldn't relate. So what my wife and I have been very conscious of where we've seen to help kids appreciate what they have, we do active service. And we might do it in things they love. So my one son loves animals. So we go to the no-kill shelter and walk the dogs. Um, two of my boys love the ocean. So we've actually gone out and do service projects for surfing where we take out blind and deaf children surfing. We take out paraplegics and quadriplegics surfing. Um, we've gone and we do something called pizza Friday, which is a pretty popular video where we buy pizzas. First, we bring them to the police department and fire department. Then we started to pass them out to the, the homeless people and the reactions of us giving this gift with nothing where people say, Oh no, you don't want to do have been incredible. So, and I've gone to active service things, which are a little more expensive to go build houses in Mexico, but by them physically and mentally being completely in this active service, I've heard the words come back on reflections and different retreats. We've run around service and contribution saying, wow, I didn't realize how good I had it. So you can't be afraid to keep your kids in a bubble. That's a terrible idea. You want to expand them into things that show the realities, the practical affairs of life. Uh, and that, Andy, has been my best way to find that, is getting them involved in acts of service and having open communication with them. If you're just close to them and you don't, you're not vulnerable, you don't have open conversations with them, and you don't get them involved in acts of service and contribution, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle then. Yeah, yeah. And I know you've been at this for a while. You're sharing some real results with me right now with your kids' reactions. What type of results have you heard from other families who've embraced this type of one-on-one -on -one time and also spending some dedicated time with your kids to help them understand gratitude and appreciation? Yeah, they, they feel they feel more present. You know, when they're there, they're actually there. They feel more consistent. You know, inconsistency in entrepreneurs goes hand in hand with home life. You're running to this and trying to get this thing done. So they say inconsistency grows up. They feel like there's more mutual trust and respect. There's more fun because these things that were usually things can, can ignite more fun. 
And overall, it's a more peaceful and relaxing home environment. Uh, and the thing is, you know, that's exciting. It's great. It takes a little bit of focused attention. Any subject you truly care about will take some dedicated learning to really go to the next level and, and become more proficient at it. You know, and the problem is when we're busy business people, a lot of entrepreneurs or business people say, oh, family, no, no, I got that down. I'm good there. And, and I get it. But, uh, but we, you want to look at that. You really want to look at getting some focused learning in that area. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, we were talking to this crowd of people who are working hard to grow their income or busy entrepreneurs because they like results. They want to grow their income. They want to hit that net worth mark. But the real results, you know, in something like this can be just a more peaceful home, a more, I guess, a calm sense and even in your personal mental health, you know, things like that that yeah. can help you to perform better at work and also just have a happier life. So I really appreciate you taking the time to share this uh, with us today, Jim. You've got a great book that I listened to this summer when I was riding with my kids up north on a trip to Marquette, Michigan to visit some family, and it really had a nice impact on my life. Can you tell people about your book and, and where they can find it? Yeah, the family board meeting is uh, on Amazon. It's an Amazon bestseller, actually in business, entrepreneurship, uh, and family and relationships. There's three categories because it all kind of combines those things. And it's a short, easy read. We call it a, a New York to Florida read. You can take a, get on a flight from New York to Florida and it's that quick. But the strategy and the principles really resonate. They're easy to apply and understand and see real results from. So I encourage you to pick up a copy. It's only like $10. And it, right now, we're, we're, there are thousands of families using this and the principles. And it just simply helps simplify and ground their family life, which is that's my purpose. That's my mission. Absolutely. And if people want to just connect with you or learn more about you, where's the best place to go? Yeah, if they want to learn more about what I do, my speaking and workshops and, and different uh, family impact programs we have, just go to www.18summers.com. Excellent. Well, Jim, thank you so much for your time today. I am a young father and I'm trying to do the best that I can for my family. So this was very impactful for me and I know it will be the same for a lot of people listening today. So thank you. You're welcome, Andy. And don't be hard on yourself. I always say that we're all still learning. My four-year-old actually taught me that. We're all still learning, so we're going to make mistakes, but get back on the horse. That is, a, that is the best quote of the day, especially from a four-year-old. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you, Jim. <laughs> Thank you, Andy.